Hey guys, it's me, Jesse. I'm here with my brother, Oliver. For those who don't know, I actually have a brother, yes. And he is a professional MMA fighter, although he used to practice karate, just like I do. And we're in Iceland right now. As you can see, that's what an Icelandic street looks like. We're at the hotel because we're here for Easter for a short trip together with mom who's over there and I thought we would just take a couple of minutes to talk about the connection between karate and MMA because since me and Oliver basically grew up in the dojo together we have been practicing karate for well me basically all my life and Oliver not as long because he switched over to the more modern combat uh, full contact fighting sports uh, as he got older uh, but, but I still did karate for like 15 to 18 years something like that when I was in high school I switched over yes exactly so Oliver has that karate background even though he does professional MMA these days and me of course I've been to Okinawa a lot. I've traveled a lot. I've watched Oliver uh, compete and practice karate and MMA his whole life. So I thought we would just take, uh, you know, just do a quick conversation to see uh, what the different perspectives are when it comes to combining and uh, understanding the differences and similarities between mixed martial arts or MMA and karate, both from a sports perspective and a more traditional self-defense based uh, perspective. So maybe you can just start by talking about your transition from karate to MMA, how that happened and why that happened. And make sure to be close to the iPhone because yeah. the camera is really bad. Yeah, so as Jesse said, I was uh, also starting with uh, karate and uh, I was always uh, more into the kumite part where Jesse was more into the kata part but we were both competing in both categories um, however, as I, I grew older um, I started trying out more different martial arts uh, I practiced, uh, for example, kickboxing and Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and I felt after a while that the, the rule set of uh, Kumite um, WKF Karate uh, was too limited and uh, it was always these uh, warnings all the time, Chukoku, uh, for grabbing the gi or just this kind of small stuff and as I uh, started training MMA I started learning more takedowns and stuff and and this grew into my movement pattern so when i was competing in kumite i got worn so much uh, and I, I just grew tired of uh, of the rules i wanted a more free uh, sport uh, of fighting so that's that's how i ended up doing the mma basically yes so then did you stop karate completely and start MMA or how did that transition happen uh, practically speaking so uh, at first I just added some some more boxing and uh, and uh, jiu-jitsu because that was the part I was missing out from the uh, karate training uh, I was an ex expert at the long distance because that's what you do in Kumite uh, but in the shorter distance like uh, head movement and boxing and combinations throwing uppercuts and hooks, it's not so common in, in uh, sports karate uh, so that was something I had to practice more so I did the, uh, I did them side by side the yeah. karate practice and the kickboxing and the jiu jitsu but then uh, I, I, I went more and more into the uh, MMA part because I realized there was all already so much to learn in, in the MMA with the wrestling and everything so I didn't want to put any more st more uh, things into it like the gi because you don't use a gi in uh, in MMA so I wanted to cut out everything that I wouldn't do when I was fighting MMA and just train specifically for what I was going to compete in 
And so what would you say were the most important parts about sports karate or kumite in particular that you felt you wanted to keep as you moved on to MMA? Because like you said, for example, the karate uniform, you had to get rid of that and maybe some other stuff like talk more about that. What did you decide to keep? What was useful for mixed martial arts and what was or is not useful? from the karate standpoint? So one of the biggest things was when I started sparring Thai boxers and kickboxers, uh, I realized they don't understand the long distance the way kumite fighters do, and they don't have the same footwork. Uh, so if you do sports karate, you move in a very certain way. Uh, the bouncing and the in and out footwork is, is very fast. Uh, also, we have a different technique of kicking so for example I can just lift my uh, leg up and kick you in the head but the, the Thai boxers that I sparred usually ha have to do uh, like a shuffle step or something first uh, so my feet uh, was a big advantage I was much quicker uh, also what I mean by uh, they don't understand the long distance is they're used to fighting at medium to short distance and that's like an arm's length uh, so when you, I was out of reach, uh, out of arm's length, uh, they couldn't hit me and I could just move the way I wanted and circle around and move in and out and they had a hard time hitting me. Uh, so the footwork was uh, for sure the, the best thing uh, from, I took from karate uh, and what I had to uh, learn. learn yeah, was uh, well the habit of having your hands pretty low so in the mid-range I had to uh, improve my boxing skills, the head movement, and say if I got stuck uh, on, the, uh, on the cage or, or cornered uh, in a ring, uh, between the ring ropes, uh, I, I couldn't move my feet so I had to learn uh, a different guard, uh, better defense, using the shoulders for defense, and also uh, slipping, rolling, under punches. Uh, yeah, because most karate fighters usually have one type of guard which is based on the long range or long distance right yeah, yeah. but in mixed martial arts you have all these different ranges so basically you have to adjust the way you protect yourself depending on the distance from your opponent right correct yeah so i i, I usually when i teach i uh, divide it into three distances you have the long distance which is what you use in kumite it's when you're up to an arm's length. Uh, so uh, that's when you use your feet uh, as the main point of defense, moving around. Uh, and, uh, and this is what we call Tai Sabaki or Ashi Sabaki in Japanese, yeah. the footwork, right? Yeah. And then you have the medium distance, which is the punching range. That's where you see most Thai boxers, kickboxers, and boxing. Yeah. Uh, and then you have to have a different uh, posture and and uh, tighter guard. guard. Yeah, exactly. And you have to use your shoulders more for defending, yeah. because your shoulders is is closer to your shin and your head than your hands. So when you're at the long distance, you can parry using your hands, but when you're in the close distance. Uh, this isn't as much of a defense because with the small gloves in MMA you're gonna get through all the uh, holes so yeah. uh, you have to use your shoulders more for the right. defense yeah and as I, I said uh, before when you can't move your feet you have to move your head instead right uh, and then the last thing is distance is the clinch which right. means we have uh, contact with each other yeah uh, and that's a whole another game that I hadn't developed so much in my uh, uh, karate exactly and that's because I think modern karate, especially if you compete or do the sports karate, is not really suited for that uh, uptight, up close mm. uh, combat. It's always the long range, closing the gap, and then the referee stops the fight, yeah. right? But in MMA, the fight continues even though you're this close. Exactly. So you had to learn how to continue from that point. It's true, yeah. With uh, like takedowns and elbows and knees which of course is part of traditional karate because if you look at kata, the forms that we do in karate, uh, the applications, what we usually call bunkai in Japanese, consist of these types of techniques, close quarter combat like elbows and 
you know, these nasty things that are usually forbidden if you compete in karate and you were not used to doing those techniques like full contact mm -hmm. uh, against other people unless you did bunkai for a kata. So exactly. And that's where a lot of people make that connection between traditional karate and MMA, speaking of bunkai or the kata applications. Of course, there are things in kata or bunkai that are not allowed in, in uh, MMA, like kicking somebody in the nuts or poking him in the eyes, but a lot of the legal techniques can be found in the kata of karate as well. And so what about the groundwork? Because once you close that distance, you get someone to the ground. How was it to experience practicing those uh, jujitsu techniques, perhaps uh, groundwork, sorry, uh, as a karate stand-up fighter from the beginning? Yeah, so uh, as you said, uh, the fight continues in, in the sports karate. Uh, the judge breaks yeah. the fight in between, so I was uh, used to throwing single punches uh, and I had to learn to combine my techniques into longer series yeah. and also uh, you couldn't grab the gi uh, for more than like a couple of seconds or just a second yeah. uh, so I had to learn uh, how to grab not, not, uh, not in the gi uh, but uh, like using hooks your right. like under hooks and over hooks with your arms in and MMA yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, so that was uh, a new part uh, of, of, uh, of the game for me. Yeah. Uh, and uh, yeah, as you said, we, we come from a traditional karate background, so I had a, a bit of understanding of the grappling too from the bunkai and, and this type of training. And I knew a few uh, throws and, and submissions, yeah. uh, but uh, not, not uh, as close to as much as I, I know now. So. Uh, yeah. Basically, when I started learning the, the jiu-jitsu, it was like a whole new world opened up to me. And I was a black belt in karate, and suddenly I, I felt like a white belt again. Yeah. Uh, so it, it, was, uh, it was different mixed emotions, you know, uh, because it was, it was fun to be a beginner again yeah. and, and had so much more to learn. But also, I thought I was good in fighting, but yeah. suddenly I felt I knew nothing, you know? Exactly. Because uh, everyone can throw a haymaker and yeah. make a dangerous opponent standing up, but on the ground, say you have just a couple of months of experience in the grappling, you're gonna, if you grapple someone who has no, no experience at all, he's gonna be like a fish on land. Exactly. Uh, so, uh, yeah, that was a big part uh, uh, of my development, uh, and I focused mainly on the grappling uh, and the jiu jitsu for, for my first. Uh, years after transitioning into the MMA, mm. uh, and I really fell in love with it. Yeah. At first, I, I didn't like it that much uh, because I hadn't done it so much. Yeah. Uh, but and usually, I, yeah. you don't like stuff that you're not good at, right? Exactly. If it's too big of a challenge, then you kind of don't really want to do that. But in order to become really good at something, you have to learn to love the process, right? Mm -hmm. Even though you're not good at it, so you have to have that that shoshin, the beginner's mind, as we say in Japanese. Yeah. And even though you're a champion, you have to practice like you're not a champion in order to stay the champion, right? Yeah. But uh, I've also one, uh, one thing I th uh, think is, is pretty funny is because I don't have a, uh, a, a real grappling background. I didn't start with Brazilian Jiu Jitsu or uh, similar as most fighters do. Uh, I learned a little bit from here and a little bit from there. So uh, I have a, like a mix of jiu-jitsu and catch wrestling and, uh, and Greco-Roma wrestling and uh, I, I developed like a hybrid uh, wrestling style uh, so it's, it's very unique to me yeah. and, and my body type also. Yeah. Um, I, I remember when I was uh, a kid in our martial arts school we had Brazilian jiu-jitsu uh, teachers come in uh, to help pay the bills and I used to attend those classes when I was younger when I was uh, like, uh, I don't know, 12 or something. And even though I only learned the basic positions and the basic submissions, like the straight arm lock and some chokes and stuff, it made such a huge difference. It was like night and day mm -hmm. when we had guests coming to the dojo who had only practiced karate and I would do sparring with them. When I got them to the ground, and I started doing this super basic groundwork, 
they, I could see the panic in their eyes, like they had never experienced this realm, this world of ground fighting. And I was just a white belt, but I still knew something, and mm. that made all the difference. Yeah. And I thought this experience was so profound when I started to see how powerful it was to just have a little bit of knowledge on the ground that when I organized the Karate Nerd Experience in 2015, I invited uh, Sensei or Maestro, as they say, uh, Waldo Zapata, mm. to teach uh, the basics of ground fighting for, specifically for karate practitioners. Because as a karate practitioner, you don't want to be on the ground and spend time there. You want to use the 80-20 principle. You want to just learn you know, the, the, those basic 20% of ground techniques that will have 80% of the results to help you get back up and continue standing. Because your specialty as a karate fighter is to fight standing up, right? Oh, yeah. And you don't want to waste time on the ground, not more than you have to. So just learn how to defend from the basic positions how to fall safely, how to get up efficiently, and what would you say are like the three most important submissions or joint locks for someone who uh, wants to learn some basic ground fighting for karate? Mm, that's a good question because I, I think uh, most people start uh, in the wrong end. They want to learn all these cool submissions and, and uh, attacks first before knowing the positions. So there's a famous ex expression when you grapple it's, it, that goes uh, position before submission, which means that if you're too eager to attack your opponent, he's going to be able to escape because you lose your pressure of him and, uh, and he's going to get out of your grips. So the first thing is to learn uh, how to put your body weight on your opponent uh, from every uh, single position. Uh, how to control him and keep him there and, uh, and uh, shift your body weight as your uh, opponent moves sideways or trying to get out. And so to me this sounds like what we do in karate. The first thing we learn is stances, right? Yeah. Positions. When you're a white belt or yellow belt, you try to learn all the different positions like kibadachi, shikodachi, zenkutsudachi, nekoashi dachi and so on. And then from there you learn how to move in and out of these positions, stances as we call them. And that's exactly what I hear you saying, basically on the ground. Mm. And then the equivalent in karate would be then to add punches and kicks and blocks and strikes mm. as you stand and move around. And would that be the next step then on the ground to learn the submissions? Yeah, uh, so well, if we're talking about MMA, uh, I think it's, it's easier to just lie there and punch someone yeah. instead of uh, grabbing submissions. But um, that's the next thing, like you shouldn't be searching for submissions all the time, no. but you let them happen by uh, your opponent's mistakes. Yeah. So say I get a good uh, top position on you and I start punching, your arms is gonna come up like this to defend, yeah. and that gives me the, the chance to grab your arm and go for a submission. Right. Or if you move in a certain way, I can catch you in your, in your transition, mm in some uh, kind of hold submission lock. So you don't actively search for a specific joint lock or choke or, or something like that. You just uh, try to ground and pound them and then see what opportunities present themselves. Most of the time that's what happens, yeah. And that's interesting because that sounds like something Sensei Anthony Vinicio said. And for those of you who follow my work, you might recognize that name because he was the guest instructor of the Karate Nerd Experience last year, KNX 16, and he is a famous uh, UFC MMA coach and uh, a fighter as well, and also national champion in, in fighting, in kumite, in karate, and he's from Brazil. So he combined these, uh, the sport of MMA and the traditional karate techniques to a really high level. And at the Karate Nerd Experience, I remember one of the quotes from his session was that, if you search for the knockout, you're not gonna get it. Knockouts come to you. And so that's basically what you're saying when it comes to the ground fighting yeah. or, or the groundwork that you let the submission come to you. You just stay open to the possibility, right? Yeah. And then you basically just try to, to fight your best, but not actively search for it. Yeah. Yeah. I really agree with that, uh, that uh, 
thing you said that about the knockout. Yeah, yeah. that you should, shouldn't search for it because yeah. uh, I I felt the same when I was uh, fighting as an amateur in the beginning. I was uh, always searching for the knockout, and that yeah. means you get a little bit more tense and you're doing a little uh, wider, bigger motions. Your yeah. opponent's gonna see when you start attacking, and you're slower and. Yeah, nothing really works. So it, maybe it's because when you're searching for a knockout, then you, you become narrow-minded, and maybe you stop seeing other possibilities yeah. that could have led to a better knockout because yeah. you're so stuck in this, you know, I'm gonna get that right hook or something like that. A and also your thinking about it and your thought is much slower than your reflex. Right. So if instead you would have been like, uh, having an empty mind and just uh, uh, and just moving along uh, with the situation yeah. suddenly your your reflexes are just gonna throw the punch instead of you thinking of throwing the punch and, yeah. and you're gonna land with much more speed and, and power and so that's like Bruce Lee said you don't punch it punches yeah. or the punch goes when it has to without you trying actively to do that yeah it's so it's so, so true uh, yeah. it's not just doesn't just sound good, but it's actually like that. Yeah. Uh, the the all of the times I've got my knockouts, I haven't been searching for them or thinking about it. Uh, I was thinking about throwing a combo or just throwing my leg or hand out there, and and suddenly, like I was as surprised as my opponent. Wow! It hit, and he got he, he fell down. So, yeah. And so, for those of us who do not practice full contact combat sports what is it like to knock someone out well as i said like the the times i've i've knocked my opponent out i've i've been as surprised as him probably so yeah. the first time it happened I, I was fighting the amateur championships here in sweden we're not in sweden now we're in iceland but anyway yeah, yeah back yeah. in sweden back yeah. in sweden uh, and uh, I was fighting this guy and, and the referee says, says fight so I'm just bouncing around and he, he comes at me and I'm just uh, from nowhere throwing, uh, starting a combo and I was gonna end with a kick but one of my punches caught him on the shin it was six seconds into the fight and he yeah. just fell right on his face yeah. and, and I was like in shock like what, what happened is it already over yeah. because I had uh, traveled all across uh, Sweden yeah. I had uh, slept in a hotel like yeah. the day before and then after six seconds I didn't know what happened <laughs> uh, and probably he didn't know too so yeah. it was I just caught him on the shin with a hook yeah and so I guess people would say that that was a lucky punch so what is your do would, would you call that luck or, or is it skill timing timing and reflex yeah because I was I was not acting I was reacting he was stepping yeah. forward and I was taking a side step throwing a hook like I've been practiced uh, thousands of times right uh, and I think that's uh, how how you have to practice if you wanna if you wanna be become really good not just thinking about technique but uh, reaction and reflex right so for example every time your opponent does a you're gonna do B so if yeah. he steps forward with a punch, I'm gonna sidestep with a hook. Yeah. If he throws a front kick, I'm just gonna pivot and, and throw my uh, right cross. Yeah. Uh, so you have all these reactions to his attacks. And then you don't have to think anything in the fight. You yeah. can just flow and it's gonna happen uh, automatically because you've practiced it thousands of times. But, but okay, so your opponent can throw like hundreds or thousands of different techniques you can't possibly practice reaction a perfect reaction to each and every technique so what is the mindset or how is the training you know how do you how do you answer that because you, you can't have one solution for each attack right no so instead of instead of practicing uh, a defense for every attack i think uh, you should practice uh, like uh, you should have a certain behavior and movement pattern at every distance. So there's, as I told you before, there's three distances. So it's a strategy. Yeah. N not exactly technique. No, no, yeah, more like tactics. Tactics, yeah. Yeah, so at the long, long distance, I'm gonna move and use my body in a certain way. 
and at a long distance, the only thing he can throw at me are the long techniques, straight punches and like kicks. Yeah. So if I have a defense for a front kick, a roundhouse kick, uh, and a low kick, that's basically the the most common kicks. Yeah. And then the straight punches. So so that means I need to have like four reactions. Yeah. And then at the mid mid range, uh, we got the boxing. He can throw straight punches, hooks, and uppercuts. Okay, yeah. so I have answer for that too. Yeah. Uh, and then in the clinch, it's another game. We have all the trips and throws and the stuff. But then you ha have to use a different posture. Yeah. You have to raise your your shoulders and be more like a the turtle sh turtle shell, as we like to yeah. call it. Yeah. Okay. And uh, so. Uh, just going back to the groundwork for for one second. Yeah. What would you say are the important things to understand when it comes to punching and elbowing and doing what you call ground and pound? Because, you know, there is this rule when you're fighting in MMA that you have to defend yourself intelligently. Yeah. And this is like in the rules. So if someone uh, is thrown to the ground, he gets punched and he just does this then the referee will stop the fight, right? Yeah. So the idea is that you need to have a smart way or a solution to defend yourself on the ground, not just standing up. And so if we as karate practitioners get thrown to the ground, how should we think to intelligently defend or protect ourselves on the ground? Because submissions, there are, there are ways to reverse uh, different holds and ways to get out of chokes and these technical details but when those punches are just raining down what is the thought process behind that H how do you combat that i think uh, one important thing to have in mind is it's easier to move your own body than moving your opponents but when people panic they want to grab hold of the the other person and uh, like pull them on top of them because they want to close the distance uh, or they try to like uh, panically attack back, but that means you're gonna open yourself up instead of having a tight defense. Right. Uh, so, um, as I said, you have to move your own body. It's, it's uh, much easier and you expend less energy than moving your opponent. It's the same for the clinch when you're standing up, yeah. uh, like on the ground. Uh, and I think it's it's good to have uh, some uh, mobility exercises and, and uh, uh, be movement intelligent, be able to move your body in, in, in different ways so you can, uh, you can adapt to any situation that happens on the ground when you're grappling and, and get out of there. Um, and, uh, and well, yeah, also uh, having a, a good defense, a good uh, guard, uh, with your hands and mm. uh, not trying to reach for the punches or, or punch back. Yeah, because that's what you see when somebody gets thrown down, their, their basic instinct is to do this. Yeah. Just to like stop the punches. Exactly. Exactly. But that doesn't work, right? No. That's one of the most common uh, beginner mistakes. Yeah. Uh, and, and for example, if you have your uh, opponent mounted on you, they try to push him away like this. and, and uh, all of this is open for the other guy's strikes instead of working your way out of there. Yeah, and that reminds me, that's how I lost uh, my, my first MMA fight. Yeah. Or the rules are actually called shoot fighting because you can't punch on the ground because that's the amateur rules that I had to compete in. And so uh, when, you, when you did that move, that's exactly what I did. So this guy had me mounted and he started to push his arm into my uh, throat so my basic instinct just push your arm here. my <clears throat> my instinct was to just push that arm up right but that was a setup and I didn't know this because I hadn't practiced that much on the ground so he just let the choke go so basically my arms shot up I overextended my elbow big mistake right he just pulled that arm out and did, a, did an arm bar on me and I lost uh, because yeah. of that yeah i remember that fight you tra trained like two times for that fight <laughs> yeah yeah uh, and uh, and uh, didn't do that and much that, no but and that's fun because some people think that i'm crazy because i only practiced two mma sessions before this full contact fight but i've been doing traditional karate since i was a kid so 
you know, I'm not afraid to get hit or to hit someone. And I think your mentality or your mindset uh, can overcompensate sometimes for lack of technique or your uh, physical abilities or inabilities. Because I remember I was super tired because every time I tried to punch that guy and I missed, I was like, oh no, there goes all my energy. And then he ducks, oh no. So like I could basically feel my my strength and power and energy just wasted in thin air around me because I didn't connect with those punches and the reason is I had only been punching full contact on focus pads yeah. and focus pads they don't move around but this guy did because he was not a focus pad so I had practiced to punch on stationary targets and that skill didn't really translate to the uh, unpredictable environment of a full contact fight and also when you hit the pads you hit with 100% force yeah and and uh, like every experienced fighter know you can't go 100% all the time because you're gonna burn out your energy super fast and I didn't realize so, that no. I was going 100% with each technique because I was just thinking that I would knock this guy out and I mean, I did do a Ushiro Geri, the spinning back kick that connected, and that was really good because afterwards the guy told me that I kicked like a horse. So, yeah, and that was like my one big takeaway from that fight. Yeah. I didn't care that I lost because I had fun. I connected with that spinning back kick, and then the rest was just, you know, chalk it down to a learning experience. Yeah, well, you kicked him pretty good for two, three minutes, I remember. Yeah. And uh, you could see all, all the uh, life lust from his uh, face, just, uh, <laughs> he was like a zombie, he looked pretty pale, so I think he was happy when you ended up on the ground. <laughs> yeah, because he was a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu fighter, because uh, I, I saw that his pants had the, the Gracie logo when he was warming up, so I knew that he would be good on the ground, but like I said, I had never experienced that type of choke, which was a setup, like I said. So I didn't know that to not fall in that trap. Yeah. And if you don't have that experience, it's hard to, you know, to know what to do. Yeah. But uh, that thing that we talked about, like uh, not going 100%, I yeah. think that's also a, a, a big learning uh, lesson uh, yeah. for a lot of people. Because uh, if you're uh, well trained, you can you can uh, be on your 90% for a long time. Like marathon runners can be on their 90% heart rate, uh, maximum heart rate uh, at, at uh, very long times. But as soon as you go over that anabolic uh, threshold and go into the lactic acid area, there's no turning back. You need, a, you yeah. need more than, a, than a, like, uh, the rest that you get between the rounds to recover from that. Yeah. So you only go 100% when you really know you're going to finish someone. Yeah. Th that's also what happened in my last fight because I, the guy that I fought, he, he ended up on the bottom and I started punching from the top and I, s I saw he, he, him uh, starting to t turn away and, 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 uh, and the cover up. Yeah. And I had two voices in my head. One was saying, hey, don't, don't, don't go over that threshold now because yeah. you're going to burn yourself out. And Stay cool. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Uh, and that was like the lazy or the energy efficient side of, of myself. Yeah. And the other voice in my head said, keep going because you're going to win this. Smell the blood. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So uh, it's, it's uh, interesting which voice uh, wins the yeah. one you listen to. And I think that the, the whole mind game or the mentality of a fighter or anyone who's training something hard and wants to achieve greatness and excellence I think mindset is a huge part of it For because sure. there are so many ways we self-sabotage because of the way we think and we have those two voices right we have the yeah. angel and the devil and they're fighting each other so what is your take on the whole uh, mentality or what's the best state of mind in your opinion for a fighter I think uh, it's very individual so depends on if you're a, a very relaxed and calm person in general or if you're pretty tense uh, already uh, then you need different kind of, of uh, warm-ups and yeah. preparation so uh, me for example I'm, I'm pretty 
uh, calm and relaxed usually uh, so um, I need a little bit more like uh, toughness and I need my coach to yell and slap you uh, <laughs> not that <laughs> uh, that much but uh, more, more of that side uh, whereas someone who is a little bit tense and a little bit nervous uh, already he needs to to just maybe calm down and breathe right uh, because if you go in there and you're a little bit tense already yeah. then your heart gate rate is gonna go uh, up much faster yeah uh, and you're gonna get tired quickly yeah so exactly. so that thing is is pretty individual yeah uh, but as they say like the mental game is 90 percent of the fight yeah uh, and and i believe there's much in that uh, statement because uh, if you have two fighters say one is more skilled technically yeah. uh, but the other one believes more in his skills yeah he's more confident yeah i would put my money on the more confident fighter every yeah. day yeah uh, because he's gonna be able to use his skills Right. Uh, I've seen so many times really good fighters in the gym when they fight they freeze right because I don't know maybe they're uh, afraid of losing or, yeah. or afraid of making mistakes so they hold themselves back right and uh, they have these barriers built up in their uh, in their mind yeah uh, and if you don't break those barriers then it's very hard to to uh, achieve anything basically. yeah yeah for yeah sure Okay guys, we've been going for 36 minutes and 24 seconds according to my phone right here and my battery is almost dead so it's time to wrap this up. Do you have any final uh, parting piece of advice for all of the karate nerds or MMA fighters watching this who want to understand more about that connection between karate and MMA and uh, basically your final words? Well, I think uh, um, I'm going to use uh, another uh, quote there because, uh, um, like, to see your own mountain better, you you maybe need to climb uh, another mountain next to it. Uh, so, if you're interested in in uh, in martial arts in general, I think you shouldn't be be restricted to your style or your own gym but I think it's it's uh, good for you to explore different martial arts and uh, and uh, don't be afraid to try something uh, y you're not good at for, uh, for example grappling or jiu-jitsu because you're gonna get a whole new uh, view of the martial art world and of fighting so if you're interested in fighting uh, you can't leave anything out. I think you should try everything and and uh, just find a, a good gym with a good atmosphere yeah. And, yeah, to develop. And interestingly enough, that's what all the old karate masters did. They had an open mind and they just tried to collect and learn and share as many awesome, effective, efficient techniques as possible. And some of those they put together into movement patterns known as kata, of course. And that's basically how karate started. And that's why I like to say that karate is the original MMA. But now MMA, of course, is its own sport, you could yeah. say. So it's not really a mix of, a true mix of different martial arts. But basically what you're doing is mixing different martial arts still. You're going yeah. out and you, you do Taekwondo, you do Karate, you take this and that and that and then put together into your own unique uh, individual personal expression of martial arts yeah and in the end I think every one of us can do that whether we practice karate or boxing or judo or whatever just uh, make sure that it's that it's from your heart and that you're not not just uh, copying what someone else is teaching you of course there are different stages of your own journey or evolution in the martial arts and in the beginning it's important that you follow exactly what you learn but it's equally important to let that go to find your own true essence of the martial arts. Yeah, and, and know why you're doing it too. Yes. For, for example, like uh, MMA is a sport. Yeah. Whereas karate, for me, it's a, it's a, a lifestyle so much more than just the, the physical aspect. Yeah. I, I, I was uh, brought up with the, all those traditional values, so yeah. I was disciplined by karate. Yeah. And, and that, that thing, I don't think you can find it in, in most modern MMA uh, gyms yeah uh, because it's more just the physical the sport side of it right so you need the balance there if you wanna really develop as a human being exactly and as we all know karate begins and ends 
with respect. All right, guys, bye. We're going to a hot spring.